So as, as Dr. Chow mentioned, I'm uh, talking today about uh, chapters 19 and 20 of the Lotus Sutta. And if you've missed the first 18, that's okay. Each of these chapters is pretty rich with teachings and the teachings will stand alone. Um, but they're all also on YouTube. So if you wanna see what I said in previous weeks, you can do that. And um, there's, oh, we're, we're only maybe three or four talks away from the end of this. So um, I'm gonna miss this. <laughs> I really uh, have enjoyed talking about the Lotus Sutra. And chapter 19 talks about the benefits that accrue to someone who teaches this sutra. And the, the Buddha is talking and he says that a number of good results accrue to anyone who teaches this particular scripture. And he goes into a lot of detail about this, but just to sum it up, the Buddha is saying that by teaching this, if you become a teacher of this sutra, that thousands of benefits result in terms of purifying and thereby enhancing the sense faculties. Uh, so the, the five senses we normally think of, plus the, the mind and the body. So here's what the Buddha says in the scripture. He says, a teacher receives 800 eye benefits, 1200 ear benefits, 800 nose benefits, 1200 tongue benefits, 800 body benefits, and 1200 mind benefits. And with these benefits, they will be able to adorn their senses, making all of them pure. So it goes, he goes into a lot of detail about what this means and what these benefits are. And it's a little bit daunting when you first read this, I think, because it, it seems as if he's suggesting that if you teach this sutra, that you're gonna get, have like magical powers, like the ability to hear things that are very far away and the ability to see other worlds and things like that. And it says that you get these benefits while you're still in ordinary human form. So I've been thinking about how to approach this because I've been teaching this sutra and I can't see through walls or hear what's being said on other planets or anything like that. You know, of course I'm not finished yet. Maybe when we get to chapter 27, 28, I'll start having a little bit more of these, but I think that we can look at these th benefits in a little bit more practical way. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh has a book on this Lotus Sutra and he's talking about this, and he equates this section to describing the ability to look at something like a fallen leaf and see everything that it contains. And that's not a bad way to view this. Well, one of my favorite poems is by William Blake. He says, to see a world in a grain of sand, to see a heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So, you know, Blake was not a Buddhist, but I think the poet and many of us without being Buddhists are able to see the interdependency of things anyway. Someone said a few minutes ago, um, one of you said something about finding something appealing in this regardless of your religion. You know, you can put water in any number of containers, containers of any shape and as long as it's good pure water, it's gonna keep you sustained. And you can put truth in containers of many different shapes. And as long as it's pure truth, as long as it's the real truth, it's gonna sustain you spiritually. So you can have this experience of seeing deeper into things, even without becoming something, someone special. For example, uh, one of the benefits that he says, he's talking about the mouth benefit. And it talks about someone who teaches this sutra can eat something foul and it turns into something delicious in their mouth. So let me tell you how to do that. So when you go to lunch today, when you begin to eat, be silent for the first few minutes and eat mindfully. Maybe we'll do this as a meditation sometime Eating mindfully doesn't necessarily mean to eat slowly. Sometimes you'll talk to 
people about mindfulness practices and you'll say eat mindfully and you'll see their forks moving in slow motion through the air and stuff. It doesn't mean that. It means eat with full attention. So when you start eating, just be completely in the moment. For just a little while, don't do anything but eat. And I mean no actions of your senses, your body, or your mind. So when we eat, you, know, you think of it as something that your mouth does. But really we use our eyes, we use our nose. What we think of as taste is really a combination of uh, what the tongue does, you know, salt, bitter, sour, and so on, and what the nose does, processing fragrances that come in, you know, molecules that come into our sinuses as we chew and that sort of thing. So we use our nose. Here's our mouth, obviously. So there's touch, there's our hands, there's a stomach. You have to have a stomach in order to be able to eat. You've got to be able to have a whole body to consume things, awareness of what's going on, everything. So there's all these different things you're using. So when you first start, just take a few moments and don't do anything with any of those other faculties except eat. And if you're lucky, you're not gonna like everything that you eat. It's a lot more interesting if you eat something unpleasant because when you get the opportunity to work with something that you don't like, then you get to use your attention more skillfully. So I've said this before, and it bears repeating, our experience of life and whether it's good or bad, whether we like it or don't like it and all of that, has relatively little to do with what happens to us, but it has an awful lot to do with how we use our attention. What are we paying attention to? About two years ago this month, I went to a retreat in Vermont, and it was at the Toto Institute where they teach about methods in Japanese psychology, which come mainly from Zen and Pure Land Buddhism. And as one of our practices during this retreat, uh, it was one particular day at dinner time, we were supposed to serve dinner to one another. So there was a group of people who prepared the meal. And then we would look for someone and say, hey, can I bring you something to eat? And they would say yes, because otherwise they weren't going to get anything to eat. The deal was you couldn't eat anything that wasn't given to you. And you were required to eat and drink whatever you received. You weren't allowed to ask for anything. You weren't allowed to refuse anything. So maybe somebody puts a dressing on your salad that you don't like. You eat the salad anyway. Your attention naturally goes to the unpleasantness of the salad dressing that you don't like. But then you can start to shift your attention. Somebody took the effort of making a plate of food and bringing it to you so you didn't have to sit there and be hungry during dinner. And before that, someone had made a salad. And someone had made salad dressing, maybe it was salad dressing that came in a bottle, in which case there were a bunch of workers who made the stuff and people who put it in the store and all of those things that had to happen so that you didn't have to go without eating. And the person who made you the plate probably brought you some of a lot of different things and some of the stuff that you liked. And so suddenly dinner has gotten better. Something unpleasant has become pleasant just from using your attention better. So that particular night, uh, the person who directed the, the center where the retreat was, a guy named Greg Creech, he's a friend of mine, and colleague, and um, I made his dinner and he made mine. And I happen to know that Greg hates beets. And unfortunately, nobody had made beets that night. So I apologized to him as I gave him his food for there not being any beets, because I really wanted him to have that experience of working with something that he didn't like. Uh, but even if you like everything, you can still make it better by looking beyond how things taste to the miracle of being able to have a meal. Before you could eat, somebody had to plant seeds and sun and rain fell and little organisms that you can't see in the soil broke down other things to release minerals and so on into the soil so that the plant could absorb them. And with all of that happening, various fruits and vegetables grew and ripened. And some of the stuff that kind of comes to you from lunch, I'm sure came from a grocery store, so it was grown by farmers and 
pickers and packers had to process it. All of these things happened to make it available to you and then somebody went to the effort to make something and make a dish that you could eat. And then you have a body and a mind that are healthy enough and coordinated enough to figure out how to get the food from the plate into your mouth and the ability to process it so that it so that it becomes useful to you and supports your health. So this is what, how you change something from something unpleasant to something pleasant. You've shifted your attention from I don't like this to wow, look at this amazing miracle that has happened. I get, to, I get a meal to eat. I think the most useful part of chapter 19 probably comes in the last section where the Buddha is talking about the mind benefits. He says, when you purify the mind of obstacles, when you, purifying the mind means letting go of things that get in the, in the way of seeing things as they are, and letting go of likes and dislikes and judgments about good and bad, and just kind of seeing what's really happening. When you can do that, you start to see the Dharma everywhere. So the Buddha explains in the very last section that those who can teach the Lotus Sutra will start to see the truth in every Dharma teaching and be able to teach them as well. It's as though they have not yet obtained freedom from the outflows, they will manifest the marks described here. While these persons uphold this Sutra, they will dwell safely on rare ground, able to employ a thousand, ten thousand varieties of apt and skillful words because they uphold the Lotus Sutra. So in other words, because you understand what's being taught in this, in this scripture, you're able to understand the truth. Like the lady over there said, you see the truth wherever it is. It doesn't have to be in a certain kind of package. It doesn't have to be in a certain kind of set of verses or whatever for you to be able to understand it because, because things are revealed to you as they are. So chapter 20 is pretty short, but I, th I find it pretty important. And in this chapter, the, the Buddha is telling about this Buddha from far in the past called Never Disparaging. So here's a spoiler alert. At the end, it's revealed that Never Disparaging was a previous existence of Sakyamuni Buddha. So he got to see, the, to become the Buddha that we know by seeing future Buddhas everywhere he looked. So that this Buddha never disparaging, no matter how badly people treated him, no matter how rude they were to him or anything like that, he would go out of their, his way to bow to them and he would tell them, you're gonna become a Buddha. So there's, there's a, a Zen saying that when you become enlightened, the trees and the rocks also become enlightened. So that doesn't mean that you have some fancy enlightenment experience and then so does everything else. It means that when you see the way things really are, you see how, when you start look, looking deeply into things, you see how interconnected everything is. And your perception of the world changes. You can experience this for yourself. Take a day to just be kind. Just really make a huge effort to be kind to everything and everyone you encounter. And you'll find that you live in a kinder world. It's kind of weird the way that happens. And it's not so much that you change things, although you will, if you have the opportunity to be unkind to someone and instead you're nice to them, they're probably gonna be nicer to you back. And so think about that. If you see a Buddha in every face that you look into, isn't that gonna be a more pleasant world for you to live in? And doing that is gonna bring you closer to your own awakening. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy your lunch. <laughs>